Okay, uh, our second speaker today is Johannes Bader. He is going to talk today about Trim Graph, Differentially Private Query Processing in Private Data Federations. Great. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, but yeah, so hi everybody. Oh, this is working great. Uh, so my name is Joe Bader. I'm currently a PhD student at Northwestern University. Uh, so I work mostly in databases with a little bit on privacy and security. So this is going to be a little more of like a systems focused talk. We'll be talking about um, a use case that we have with Northwestern Hospital um, from the system that we're building to uh, enable to, them to do some of their, their analysis and help why and how we sort of like introduce differential privacy into everything. Um, and the benefits and the, the, the negatives of that. Uh, so first I want to say thank you to my uh, collaborators. So there's Shi, who is a student at Duke, who's now a, a professor, assistant professor at University of Waterloo. Uh, Will, who was a master's student, who did a lot of the grunt work of like running the experiments and all that, which is great. Um, he's now at Microsoft. Um, Ashwin, who actually was involved in the last talk as well, who's a um, professor at Duke, who's been doing you know, differential privacy with databases for a long time. And of course my advisor, Jenny Rogers, who's Wonderful, and of course, I wouldn't be here without her. Um, but yeah, so, so the title of my talk um, is Shrink Wrap Differentially Private Query Processing and Private Data Federations, right? Uh, so that's a lot of words. Um, some of them may or may not make sense to you, uh, but the goal for this talk today is hopefully that uh, we'll explain three things. First is uh, what exactly is a private data federation? Um, how does it process queries? And why should we use differential privacy uh, in, this, in this setting? Um, oh, yeah, and the one more thing, that's, that's the shrink. That's the shrink wrap icon I found. Like, I think that was, I couldn't find like, I felt like I couldn't use the actual shrink wrap because of like some trademark issues, but if you see that, that's like shrink wrap throughout this presentation. Is there a way you can like adjust your microphone? Oh yes, sorry. Is that better? It's rubbing against it. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. How's that? That's. Here. Oh, here's the green button. That's All right, perfect. Um, great, so we'll, we'll for, first do a little quick setup. Uh, so, right, so data's important, there's a lot of it. Um, modern technology, we can store and process more, enormous amounts of data we couldn't do before, uh, and so there's a lot, a lot of benefits and value now associated with data. Um, the problem is that um, it has to be, it's fragmented amongst data, many different owners. Um, and the pro the, this is mostly because there's a lot of like tr uh, security and privacy issues, right? You can't just have data, uh, all over the place, so you know, in the news we see like Facebook, Yahoo, Uber, all these issues with data breaches, uh, and so people are really hesitant to share the data because it has all this value, right? Um, uh, so one example of this um, is gonna be medical data. So medical data is, obviously it's very important to maintain the privacy of the individuals in the databases. Um, there's a lot of this data that's, that's, that's all over the place. Um, so an example here would be, so this is from Northwest, we work with Northwestern Hospital, so an example of one of the schemas they have is they have something like glucose, measurements, some sex, and diagnosis, and so these have different varying levels of privacy, right? Uh, so glucose, you can't really identify a single person with that, so that's more of a public attribute, uh, versus the sex or, or the, the actual diagnosis, that's something that's um, private, because it's personally identifiable, right? Um, and so, Something else that we're trying to do recently actually is to create data federations with all this medical data. Uh, and for example, so you have all these individual hospitals and they have all this information. They have, um, so bioinformaticists or data scientists who go through and they, medical researchers who go through and try to figure out like, you know, the incidences of cancer with the co occur with certain other diseases. Uh, and so the problem is that they have a very limited amount of data that's only on their hospital. And they can't share this information with other hospitals because of uh, legal requirements like HIPAA. Um, which is like, I think the Health and Information Protections Act of 96. Privacy and portability. Yeah, privacy and portability, I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, so there's all these legal issues where you can't actually physically show this information. Um, and so they're, they're trying to figure out how to do this. Uh, so they've developed these things called clinical data research networks, right? So these consortium of healthcare sites agree to share the data for research. And so the idea here is that by combining the data from much of the hospitals, we have a much larger set of data that we can then use to, um, you know, 
provide better um, research queries uh, and, and help people, right? Uh, and so for this project, we partnered with HealthLink, which is a Chicago-based CDRN. Uh, it's run through Northwestern Hospitals. As part of this overarching pro uh, project called Capricorn, which is uh, then associated with this, this CDRNs across the entire country. And so they're trying to make this one unified split system where everything can be executed and run. Um, right, and so the example use case of here, you'd have some sort of client who'd be a medical researcher. Uh, they'd have some sort of question, right? It's like, how many diagnoses of some rare disease X occurred? Um, and so what they would do is they would translate that into some sort of SQL query. Um, they would send some coordinator who would then send this query out to all the different databases, right? And so these are all going to be SQL databases um, sitting somewhere in these hospital systems. Um, and so these hospitals will receive the select query. Uh, but the problem is that now you're trying to access a private attribute here. And so in this case, you can't release this information. So you can't get the result. And so the client can no longer answer their query is a problem. Um, so in talking to Northwestern, we sort of try to develop an ideal solution here. Um, so we, what, what they want is a database system that can accurately evaluate queries in a federated setting, which is where uh, all these databases are physically separated, um, but we have a common schema. Uh, we want to guarantee privacy for individuals whose data is in a data set, and we want to process our queries efficiently. Right? So this is going to be important. Uh, so we went through the literature and like, tried to find some existing solutions. Uh, so I think the, right off the bat, you would think, okay, what if we just had to trust the third party, right? What if we took all the data from all data owners and put them in a single location? Uh, so the problem with this is that you can't ensure the privacy for individuals because the single location will have access to data from everybody. Um, also, you have some data reach issues because you have a single point of failure. Uh, another option that people worked with on is uh, encrypted query processing. Uh, so a canonical example would be a CryptDB. So they would use some s forms of like partial homomorphic encryption uh, to execute queries over this encrypted data. So the data will never be decrypted. You can just directly execute the queries over this. Um, the issue with that is that um, some of the techniques they were using um, are available to side channel attacks, uh, such as frequency attacks, because you were leaking, even though the data itself was protected, the access patterns were, were leaking. With public information, you would know, um, you could learn stuff about the underlying data. Um, and there, are, there has been some work in fully homomorphic encryption, which would solve some of these issues, but um, that is still much too slow to work in, in practice right now. Um, another option here is trusted execution environment, so just like the on-chip hardware enclaves, uh, similar to like Face ID on your iPhones. Uh, the problem is that there's no proper implementation that actually works. Um, I think I used Nix last year, they, I used Nix Security last year, they sort of showed you breaking Intel's version of SGX, um, which is their secure enclave, sort of on, live on stage. Um, which is very exciting, but also not so great for security. Right? Um, so, so these solutions didn't really work. So then we've, we were looking at differential privacy, right? So um, we thought, okay, we can just add some noise to our the output of our query results to protect the underlying data. Uh, so this is sort of similar to like the pink approach. Um, so this, this, this is great. This is private. It's very efficient. Uh, the problem here is that wasn't, uh, the accuracy wasn't, wasn't there for us. Um, so the, oh, first off, the client was not receiving precise results um, due to your, your added noise of the outputs. Uh, and secondly, certain queries, such as join queries um, on private attributes, you, could just, you just can't answer them, um, especially as your, the number of your clients scale. Uh, uh, and finally, you know, sort of repeated queries on the same data will sort of consume your budget over time, and eventually that data is unable to be used, right? Um, so it was OK. So a first pass, we're like, OK, differential privacy maybe not um, the ideal use. Uh, so what we then, then did was we look at secure multi-party computation. Um, and so for here, what we're able to allow us is to securely compute functions on data that's distributed across multiple data owners. Right? So you don't have a trusted third party here. A curious observer will learn nothing uh, about the data. So this will use some, sort of, some proven cryptographic protocols. Um, so the, the canonical example right, is the millionaire's problem. Um, as the setup is where you have two millionaires. They have their some net worth. They want to compute a function, which is who's richer. Uh, without, leak, without uh, revealing their private data, which is their net worth. Um, and so there's garbled circuits. Um, so Yale's garbled circuits are actually able to evaluate that function uh, securely. So this is accurate and this is, very, this is private. Uh, the problem here is that it's uh, very inefficient. Um, so here it requires something called uh, requires oblivious execution. So, you have to, so basically you need to eliminate all dependencies on underlying data. Because um, if, if there's any dependency on it, then you're going to be leaking information. 
Uh, so what this, what this means is that you have to obscure all memory access patterns in program execution. Uh, so all computation must be worst case. Uh, so for example, um, all, like a join, all joins will have to be a cross product. You have to like, evaluate the entire cross product in order to do this, or a select statement. And so if you would just you have to um, sort of scan a scan, you have to fill, scan through the entire table instead of just stopping if you're looking for a certain element. Um, so that's so there's some so there's some 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 great uh, benefits here, but this inefficiency problem is 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 kind of an issue. Um, but we 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 felt like this. Uh, so this is like sort of a, a list of all our solutions, uh, all the approaches, and the current solutions, and through the literature that we're looking at. Uh, and so we are, we so we decided that since nothing was perfect, we're going to try to first focus on accuracy and privacy, uh, and see if we can maybe make some changes to make this a little bit more efficient. All right. Uh, and so our first attempt at a solution is something we call the private data federation. Right. So this is what this in the, in the title of the talk. Uh, and so the setup here is that given a public relational database schema um, where data owners all hold a horizontal partition of the data uh, in their own database, so that's the, each hospital has a horizontal partition of the data, they all have the same public schema, right? Uh, we all be able to provide a SQL query interface for the, for the clients, so the medical researchers. Uh, we want to provide provable secure query evaluation over the union of these databases. Um, so basically we want the, 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 um, the researchers to query as if uh, to get results as if all the data was stored on a single database. Uh, and we want to provide accurate query results, so precise query results um, for them. And so we actually went through and we built the system, actually. We published this in VLDB in 2017. Uh, so it was the first time you can actually do an end-to-end -end system um, for, uh, with, with, with sort of arbitrary SQL queries. Uh, so that was really exciting. Um, so here's, like, if you remember the setup we had earlier, um, we had uh, the, the researcher who had the question, right, how many does, Diagnosis of rare disease X occurred. Um, they translate to a SQL query, send it to some coordinator, who would then pass that information out to the different uh, databases, right? And now instead of just saying, "Hey, this is a private attribute we can't use," uh, now we can actually use this secure multi-party computation, and so we can use this computation across each other, get a share of the result, so it's going to be encrypted, uh, and then pass that back uh, to the coordinator, who then pass, who then sort of combines all that information and de uh, reconstructs the, the final answer and so the client gets a query, uh, plain text result. Yes? This looks too good to be true. Is there a, a, a restriction of what kind of SQL queries can be used here? Um, so it took a while to actually implement. So we had to actually implement these in like a, uh, with the sort of secure multi-party computation language. Um, but yeah, so we, we support most Pretty much every, all the basic ones like filters, scans, joins, uh, and aggregates. Okay. Right. Uh, so yeah. So you, exactly. So there's no free lunch, right? So it's, it's it sounds great. It's perfect. But the problem is that you're there's a huge performance issue, okay. right? Because you're running everything in the worst case. Uh, so all joins are n squared, and all of a sudden you get two joins. You're going into the n cubed, and you know there's a huge explosion. Uh, and so we actually, when we actually ran these on some, some, some uh, medical research or workloads, we're getting things like you know, four to six orders of magnitude slower. Yes? Uh, is there a breakdown of how much of that is communication between parties versus? Uh, um, yeah, so actually the, in this case, the communication costs were very low, uh, relatively speaking. Uh, so most of that was um, an oblivious RAM. Or so every time you do a memory access, you have to touch every single piece of data in the entire room. Uh, because I think uh, in the previous presentation where you're, uh, yeah, so you can leak information based on access patterns, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. So you, you had to generate, generate noise within the multi-party computation protocol? Um, yeah, so we, we added dummy values into them. So um, so we're doing, uh, I can show an example here maybe. I'm, I'm asking like sampling from Laplace. Or oh, something. so at this point we're not using differential privacy at all. Ah. Right, so this is just a purely secure multi-party computation. Uh, so this is, there's no privacy budget, there's no noise or anything like that. We're getting precise query results at the output. Um, it's just that it's extremely, extremely slow. So this is like the like, secure multiple computation, right? It's been like theoretical for a long time. It just only recently has been able to, you know, be something that's sort of reasonably usable. Um, yes. 
So could you could you explain a little bit why it's oh, it's not okay why hospitals aren't comfortable releasing an aggregate like the example you had it was a count of people with diagnosis X mm -hmm. they're not comfortable releasing that number even though it's an aggregate it's not an individual row level piece of data but they are comfortable with eventually the aggregate when it's combined with say two other hospitals with that becoming public um, right so you're asking, okay yeah so let's see here um, well, so you're asking why they are comfortable releasing this result of this query instead of the ones individually from each of these databases um, I, for that that's kind of interesting I think they for, for a long time they were using anonymity as a sort of privacy guarantee uh, and so I think as a result of that, uh, so for now they're saying that like, we can trust the client in some ways. They're not going to just sort of release this data into the wild, uh, but still like these individual hospitals, they can't know what's on each individual hospital. So we're sort of, sort of obscured. It's like it's from some hospital. We don't know exactly what it is. So it's, it's, I don't, it's not like super formal, um, but that's, that's kind of how they do it. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Right, so this is the performance problem. Uh, so this is what we were struggling with to try to, to, try to fix, uh, because four to six orders of magnitude, I was sitting there running queries uh, for like some, several days, uh, which was, at the beginning of my PhD was great, because I, I, I was able to catch up on all on Netflix. Um, so I just I was hit the play, and I just could kind of watch TV shows. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that gravy chain was ended, so now I had to speed these things up. Uh, and I I'm now very far behind on my TV. Um, and so I'll explain to you how that happens. Um, all right, so now we're kind of going into uh, so the meat of the talk where we talk about how we apply differential privacy in this setting. Uh, so first, I'm going to talk about the performance bottleneck to give you intuition about why it's so slow. Um, then I'll talk about a couple of our technical contributions. Um, and then I'm going to actually go into the shrink wrap query processing uh, setup, um, talk about how we're using differentially private resizing, which is sort of the key element here. Uh, then talk about sort of a cost model. You know, as a database person, I love cost models, uh, so we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, how we use that cost model to split our privacy budget throughout our execution. And finally go over some actual experimental results um, using real, real data. Okay, great. Uh, so this is just like a typical uh, query tree. Uh, so you have your you know, SQL query up there, uh, and then you have, this is a representation of different operators, right? You have your filters, join, join, uh, and then aggregate up top. And here in the little Brackets are going to be the sizes of those, the number of tuples there, uh, the size of the output of each of these. So that there's n tuples in this medication table, n tuples in the diagnosis table, um, and this, this is I'm showing you this is the worst case scenario, right? So when I mentioned earlier, we can't assume that anything has been filtered out, right? So at, at every point we have to, to to access n tuples. We have to run this filter on n tuples. We have to run this join on n, uh, n squared tuples, on n cubed tuples, and so on, right? And so this is really really expensive. Um, and so the reason is so we have this, we're, add, we're adding padding here to protect this data because if uh, this was something less than n squared, then you would learn something, so you'd be leaking some information about that data, right? And when you leak information, if you leak, uh, run enough times, then you'll uh, be able to, to, to learn, to actually deduce what the underlying data is, right? Uh, and so then that's, this is what causes this exponential blow up. Um, and it's really, really expensive. Okay. Uh, so now we're going to go into some of the technical uh, contributions here we have. Uh, first, we had a computational differential privacy mechanism. Uh, this is to inter min minim oh, sorry, go ahead. Yes, yeah, sorry, I have a question. So in the, you want to have secure computation, which um, forces you to hide those numbers. But at the end, you're going to release the number of rows at the root? Yeah, so we, yeah, so the output, so, so yes, so our work is mostly focused on making sure we're not releasing any information during execution. Uh, and so there is the issue of like the actual answer to the query is going to be some, some, some information about the data. And so for that, we'll have to, we sort of say that, you know, this is something that you could handle with excess pattern control, or you could actually use differential privacy as well. Um, right. Um, so yeah, and I have a table in, in a little bit to talk about the trust model exactly. Um, but yes, that's, that's a great point. I'm just, just purely for execution. Um, so, I, and that's what I think was actually kind of really interesting work is we're applying differential privacy not just at the output but actually during execution to speed it up. Um, right. Okay. So yeah. So we have a, so a computational differential privacy mechanism. 
uh, so that it minimizes intermediate result padding, right? So we want to make this keep this as, make this something smaller than n squared. And as you know, as it goes through, it'll be, uh, we'll, we'll see that, that benefits as it goes up the tree. Um, so that'll speed up our query processing. Uh, second, we want to do some sort of we want to have a protocol agnostic architecture uh, because you know there's constantly new research, and we want to be able to plug and play. Um, different uh, SMC, oh, sorry, secure multi body computation protocols. Actually, in the process of writing this, uh, the, initially the, we had two different, a new protocol was released that was actually like three orders of magnitude faster than the one we were originally using. Um, so that was, so you know, it was very important for us to be able to have cost model that was general enough to, to handle all of this. Um, and so it's something that we could use to estimate our secure computation costs. Uh, and once we have that secure estimation cost estimates, then we actually can apply a budget splitting algorithm, right? Because uh, we're, we're applying a privacy budget during execution. Um, and so it's not entirely clear off, right off the bat, like how should we split it up at each of these operators, right? Um, there's a couple different strategies I'll, I'll go into later and uh, provide some experimental results um, to show. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so what we, we actually ended up doing was we had this cost model, we sort of uh, treat it as an optimization problem um, to figure out where we can apply differential privacy to maximize the benefit, right? Because uh, it's a really valuable thing. You don't want to just you know, spread it all over in an inefficient way. Um, cool. Uh, so yeah, so this is the end-to-end -end, uh, shrink wrap query processing uh, result, right? So you have a client, you have a coordinator of data owners. Um, and what it starts out with, again, we have a, the what the client does is he takes, takes, she takes a query uh, and a privacy budget, sends that to a coordinator. Uh, the coordinator will then uh, generate a private query plan, um, which is going to be based on SMC uh, and some sort of budget allocation A. Uh, pass that to the data owners, and then the data owners will each individually compute uh, the query plan, uh, get some sort of get an uh, encrypted result, send that back to the, to, the, to the coordinator, who then assembles all these shares of these results uh, and gives an unencrypted result um, back to the client. Um, so, yeah, this is the overall end to end. And we'll kind of go into where each of these, you see this little shrink app icon, we're going to go in and go in a little bit more detail. Okay. Um, oh, wrong way. Perfect. All right, so first off I want to talk about um, is our trust model, or our privacy goals and our assumptions here. Uh, so it's a lot of text, so sorry about that. Um, but here, we'll try to, I'll try to simplify it. So there's two, we have two output policies. One is where the client sees these true exact answers. Right? And so we don't, we always say like, you know, we're not going to worry about the privacy of these output results or what they're leaking. That's going to be something that's based on access controls. Um, but, oh, oh, and we also have the second policy where we say we actually have noisy ants, noisy results. So this is where we're actually using differential privacy um, to, 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 to handle the information leakage. Right? And so um, we have our data owners, right, and our clients. Uh, so in this case, we actually treat the coordinate and the client as a, you know, as a, a coordinate is an extension of the client. Right? Um, and so the privacy goal for data owners is that they have a differentially private view of our data held by other data owners, right? And so this is where a hospital can't see the, should not have access to the private data of another hospital, right? Uh, so they have a differentially private view. Um, for the client, uh, in the first policy, we would say the client only learns a query answer. Um, and the second one is, you know, the client would have a differentially private view of the data held by these data owners. Um, we assume that, um, you know, this is semi-honest, so Everybody will follow the protocol uh, honestly, but they will are curious and they will like sort of try to look at the uh, execution, try to learn stuff about the data. Uh, and, and we're assuming everybody's computationally bounded. Uh, so we're using computational differential privacy here. Um, and, and here, when, when you're seeing true answers, we assume that there's no collusion between data owners and clients. Uh, but when you have differential private app, we can, you know, we can allow them to collude as much as they want. Cool. So yeah, so this is the, our, our privacy goals and assumptions. Um, so yeah, so, so again, we're going back here, we'll show this is what we're trying to fix, right? This n squared, n cubed terms here. Can I, can I just go back to the last slide? Sure. So how should I think about these two uh, columns? Is this, do they exist in parallel? Are you making a decision? Do we move from one to the other depending on what the client does or what, what's the... Yeah, so in the, in the way we build a system, you can... Uh, it's up to whoever, I guess the DBA or deep database admin, ad administrator to say we're releasing true results or we're releasing noisy answers. Uh, and um, yeah, and so that's, that's something, you're not supposed, you, you shouldn't be flipping back and forth between these um, too much. Within a client or what, what, what does flipping back and forth mean? 
Um, so this is, so the client, maybe this, am I not explaining it? So that, yeah, so here, so this, this R term right here, is this going to be the true plain text result of this query Q? Mm -hmm. Or is it going to be a noisy R, right? Uh, and so we handle both of these situations. They say like, if, if, if the database administrator decides, hey, we're gonna release this exact true R, uh, then these are the assumptions that we'll have. And if they decide, you know, we're actually going to release a noisy version, then these are the assumptions that we'll have. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay. Um, yes? So uh, about the first row? Mm -hmm. so uh, first, should, this should, row. Should, uh, should I think about this as a, as a multi-party computation protocol that has leakage, but the leakage is eventually private? Or um, yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah, because Let's see if I can do. Okay, so these ends are going to become. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so normally you wouldn't have any leakage uh, here, right? So this is all it's completely padded, no leakage. Um, but what we're saying is we're going to actually make this a differentiated private size. Okay. And so that, that will now leak information. And so the intuition here is that, like, what we're saying is that, like, um, you know, fully private or fully secure is too expensive. And so can we selectively leak a little bit of information and get a huge performance gain, right? And, then, and we're using differential privacy to figure out, okay, well, how can we bound this information leakage? Okay. Yeah, so most, the whole thing is about privacy versus performance. And trade off. Um, yes, so this is part of it. Any other questions about this? Perfect. How am I doing on time? You doing well? Yeah, it's good at like 15 minutes. Perfect. Um, Right, yes, yeah. so try and get rid of these n squared n cubed terms. And so we here is we have this differentially private resizing. Um, so this will be an example. So let's take an example of a join. So we're joining two tables R and S. Uh, and in the plain text version, we would just have is that this would be the result of this, right? This is just, I don't know, whatever the, the, the size of the output is here. Uh, in the oblivious version, we have uh, exhaustive padding. So this would be n size n squared, right? So this would be. You know, whatever the size of R times the size of S. So this is you know, very expensive to, and then uh, in secure multiple SMC, we'd have to ex, you know, process this entire thing here. Um, but what we did in shrink wrap actually was we say, okay, well, what if we now have a different G private size? Um, so what we do is we take, uh, well, if our new size is gonna be what the true cardinality is, what this true real data is, uh, plus some Laplace noise. Uh, we're here we use this, we did one sided, uh, we did a truncated Laplace, uh, so we have one-sided noise because we didn't want to eliminate any of the, uh, the tuples in here. So it's just only positive noise. With, so with high probability, we don't, we don't uh, drop any tuples. Um, and so the actual algorithm, right, is we have, we have all this data. It's going to be sort of real data and dummy data sort of mixed together. So first thing we have to do is obliviously sort it so it looks like this. Nice real data here on one side of the array, dummy data at the end of the array. Uh, then we calculate the one-sided uh, DP noise. So we figure out, okay, what's this size? Uh, and then we create, so we create this new array. So this will be an empty array of this new differentially private size. And then we just copy over uh, data you know, from here to here. So now we'll have this new array uh, that has all the real data as well as um, some dummy data. Yes? Do you have to generate all of n squared first and then cut down, or can you just generate uh, Laplace amounts? Um, yeah, so we'll have to do we'll have to do all the n squared first, um, just because it's it's for a couple of reasons. Well, one is like it's not all it's not nice and neat like this. It's kind of like all dispersed through uh, initially. Um, yeah, so that's that's kind of mean. So yeah, we can't we can't do that right away. We have to actually go through and uh, execute it first, um, and then we we decrease it. Right. So it's it's that makes it interesting because the benefit you see is actually so the benefit is so this is still expensive. But now this is now cheaper because the output, the input to this new op, next operator is smaller. Yeah. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. This is how this works. Um, so you can see this. We're going to apply these to all the different operators, and so we get so it's still be much cheaper to execute. Um, and so we actually have a we have created a cost model here for uh, how expensive this is. Basically, it's like the the size of these things. Uh, and so we, have, we first have, well, the cost of the actually implementing the operator, so actually implementing the join. Um, then we'll have the cost of the sorting and the cost of the copying here, right? Um, and so one note is that uh, we actually have to use um, cardinality estimates 
And this was not going to be totally optimal um, because you know, we, we, can, we don't know the true output of cardinalities here. We don't know the output cardinality here until we actually run the query. And if we run the query, that we're going to be paying that cost. Um, so we use some traditional, really naive um, uh, database cardinality estimates uh, to figure out, you know, to estimate what it is. So this is sort of a, it's kind of a weakness in here. So, so it's where we may be missing out on a lot of optimization opportunities because we're just guessing what it is. Um, but actually we'll show later on that it actually doesn't make so much, such a difference uh, practically. Um, but yeah, so this is our, our model for how much, um, how expensive this uh, execution is. And so once we have the cost model, what, what we do, we use that to figure out how we split our privacy budget. Um, so we, we sort of write it as an optimization problem. Uh, so we want to minimize the cost such that, you know, epsilon and deltas add up to whatever the, the totals are. Um, so the total execution privacy budget. And so we want to solve for these uh, epsilon i's and delta i's to figure out what the privacy budget uh, at each operator is, right? And so hopefully this will be uh, not a purely, not a true optimal, but like something that's real, something that's better than just a naive uh, budget split. Okay. Uh, so going back now, we can sort of see like, hopefully this, this picture makes a little bit more sense now. Uh, we can see, you know, where how we get a privacy budget, how we allocate this privacy budget, uh, and how we actually do the differential private resizing. Okay. Um, great. Uh, so now let's go on to some experimental results, right? So this is systems guys, so like, you know, having some numbers. Uh, so what we did, we actually got some data from Northwestern Hospitals, from this HealthLink data repository. Uh, we got access to, we actually actually have more years, but we actually, we chose, you know, we got one year Chicago area hospital, we used 2006, which is about 15 gigabytes of data. Uh, and then I scaled it up with synthetic data up to about, you know, 750 gigabytes. Um, and then we use a couple different both RAM model and circuit model um, secure, uh, SMC. Um, and unless otherwise state otherwise, so we report these results using, we report average execution times using epsilon about 0.5 and a delta of uh, uh, five to negative fifth. Um, one note is that it was like really difficult getting all this data um, cause, because of all these like security and privacy concerns. It actually took me, I want to say about six months to get access uh, to everything. Because I had to like, I, I put the application in, and they have to approve it through the IRB, uh, and then have to, they make you go in and take like a SQL test uh, and do everything. So that's the problem we're trying to solve: um, is um, is actually getting this to work. Uh, so this is it was actually we actually working on a different project, and we ran into these issues, and we're like, okay, this is a problem that we should really be trying to solve first before we can move on to anything else. Um, and so yeah, so it actually worked out really well that our, our partners at Northwest Hospital um, were able to give us all this information. Um, so yeah, and this including, we actually had access to their medical researchers. So they actually give us like the real queries that they were using in practice. Uh, and so these are three examples. One was a dosha study, one was this, uh, talking about comorbidity, aspirin count, uh, and this is actually a, a synthetic query that I generated based off of uh, their workload. Um, so you can see they're kind of complex, but um, some have a lot of joins, some are like sort of counting queries, um, just sort of a mix. Uh, so first off, is going to be talking about is end-to-end -end performance here. Uh, so both with and without shrink wrap. So without shrink wrap is just the pure SMC case, and with shrink wrap is going to be um, with our differentially private sizes. Uh, so these are on the bottom. We're going to be listing uh, a couple of different queries from our workload, uh, and then two different um, SMC protocols. Uh, so you can see actually it's, it's sort of dependent on the, the type of query to see how much of a speed up you get. Um, it just, but we, did, we do show that, you know, so this circuit model is oh, it's an EMP library. Uh, it was out of University of Maryland. Um, so this came out while we were writing the paper, and it was like pretty incredible. We got actually have 3x speed up over the original model, ORAM model we were using. Um, but for in both cases, we're actually still, still able to show about up to about three orders of magnitude improvement uh, just by using differential privacy. Five minutes, perfect. Um, go quickly through these then. Um, and then the next experiments we did was sort of figure out like are these trade-offs of privacy, accuracy, and performance. Um, so the first one was um, just you know, as we vary the privacy budget, how does our performance change, right? And you can sort of see as you expect, um, as you increase the privacy budget, um, you know, you're getting you know less. There's less privacy for the individuals in the database, uh, but you're getting much better performance. Um, second, uh, as we talked about, um, sort of accuracy performance. So the setup for this is that we have 
Uh, this is in the second model where we have a differentially private output. So we have, a, we have a single privacy budget, but we have two places where we can use it, both at, once at the output and once in the, um, ex during execution. So it's like figuring out, okay, if I apply more during execution or more at the output. Uh, so if we apply more during execution, that means we have a smaller uh, budget uh, to use at the output. Um, so our actually goes down, um, but our performance, because we use more during execution, our performance goes up. Um, and we actually see that the benefits of this sort of tail off as you get uh, use, um, sorry, as you to sort of tail off because you know if you're applying more privacy budget during execution, you still have a limit of just like actually um, you know what the what the tables look like, what the data looks like, um, and so there's like a point where you you get diminishing returns. Um, next, we looked at um, budget splitting strategies. Uh, so we remember I talked about a cost model and the um, uh, budget splitting to figure out like how we do things. So uh, there's the naive case, right? If you just uniformly split the budget across all the operators, uh, there's an the eager case where you spend your entire budget on your first operator and assume that because these, uh, the benefits that will cascade throughout the rest of the, the query, um, then we did an optimal when we're using our actual cost model. Uh, and then finally we compared it to an Oracle, which was using the actual true cardinalities instead of estimated cardinalities. Um, and you can kind of see here that uh, in all cases, the Oracle performed best, as you would expect. Uh, and then the optimal, but the optimal was actually very close, right? So only, you know, within, not within like, you know, 33x and 34x is not such a huge difference. Um, and you can see that like, the, you know, if we just apply uniform, it would be good at some queries, but not others. If we had eager, you know, time, we vice versa. Um, so this is just to prove that, you know, the cost modeling and budget splitting was actually useful. Uh, and it's something that was worthwhile doing. Uh, finally, we want to also show sort of how we sort of scale with more complex queries, right? And so basically we show like, you know, if there's one, we use joins as a model, as a, a shorthand for how complex the query is. As the number of joins increase, uh, uh, the, the more speed up we actually got. Um, and that sort of makes sense because, uh, you know, we're, we're, you get the sort of cascading benefits through the joins. Uh, next, we want to scale with data size. So as we inc we use for this one, we use synthetic data, um, and so as we you know increase the, d the data size, like how does that affect um, the performance here? And we saw that sort of as we had more data, we had more speed up uh, because you know you're getting more and more dummy values. But um, it was nice. This was this was a fun experiment to run, actually. Um, but yeah, and so that so those are kind of the results that we have here. Um, through our experiments, and there's a couple of open problems that we're still sort of working through with our partners. Uh, one is sort of how can we reduce privacy budget usage for large query workloads. Uh, there's a little bit of work, right, with like HDMM and things where you can sort of combine all your workloads and you know minimize the amount of privacy budget that you're using. But there's we feel like there's there's probably some better ways to do that. Um, you know, I think like we we can also sort of find better bounds on our privacy losses for each operator. Um, right now we're sort of doing a really uh, simple ways of doing it, but I think there's some, some things with maybe adaptive composition and things like that we can we kind of get we can get better uh, better bounds so we use less privacy uh, each operator and finally you know sort of dealing with or not dealing with but uh, uh, provi providing results to our users actually explaining like how can we use differential privacy and uh, and what does it actually mean to them has been has been interesting um, so the the cool part about actually this uh, project is that. Um, even if we run out of privacy budget, we can still provide uh, results to the, to the users, right? So in this case, we because we don't want to use up our budget right away, um, that's we sort of use differential privacy more as like sort of an accelerator uh, for for when like there's a, a query that's really important. Uh, we want them to to, to apply it, um, and so we got to figure out like how can we show users like when to apply differential privacy? Should we just do this automatically for them? Um, you know, sort of. There's all these like, you know, sort of user interface things that we're dealing with as well. Um, but yeah, so just to conclude, I want to say that we, you know, we, did a, we created a protocol agnostic query processing for private data federations. Uh, we created a cost model to optimize the privacy budget usage across other query operators. And um, you know, differential private, we also provide differential privacy guarantees that trade off privacy for significant uh, performance improvements. Uh, so yeah, so here's, hopefully for this talk, I was able to answer, you know, you're able to answer these three questions about you know, what is a private data federation? 
how's the process queries, and of course, you know, why is differential privacy important in, in this situation? Uh, but yeah, so thank you very much. Yeah. Couple of minutes for questions. Yes. Can, can you comment on the how you exploit the assumption that the data is horizontally partitioned, and or, or maybe give an example of a, yeah, sure, a query where each hospital can just uh, compute locally everything and then only do one addition at the top. So I cannot. Yeah, so horizontally partition, right, so that means that everybody has the same schema, uh, that's just public, um, but they each have, you know, some set of, there's some disjoint data that, within that, right? Uh, and so, yeah, there, we did do some optimizations, um, actually, as if we knew that, you know, some data for some patient was only on one hospital, then they would be the only ones that, that can actually execute that, and it didn't have to involve the other parties. Um, is that, is, that, is that answering your question? Yeah, I was thinking of examples. So looking at the setting intuitively, it looks like uh, every, for meaningful queries, uh, every hospital could just run, run the query. Because queries are going to be like, uh, how many patients, blah, 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 satisfy a certain like, condition. Oh, so yeah. You just run them locally on each of them, and then yes. a single addition, right? So That's true. So there's of a query that is not of this form. Yeah. So here we have this workload. So for here. Um, so basically, it mostly comes in when we need to join across different databases. So, so the example would be like, for a lot of times, like patients will be going to different hospitals, right? So they, they'll go to one hospital, but then they'll, you know, for another treatment, they'll go to a different one, right? And so the hospitals don't have access to that data, so they want to join. So like their initial diagnosis they got at hospital A, but later the treatment they got was hospital B. Okay. So like the, the researcher wants to know like, you know, how did the treatment uh, perform or like compared to uh, hospital A versus hospital B or you know this diagnosis time but you know hospital B doesn't have access to that information. Okay uh, yeah I thought of the horizontally partitioned as uh, no every patient is in only one hospital. Oh yeah sorry no the ho those patients are could be spread across um, in a different hospital. It's actually really important because like you know I think like really, especially like vulnerable populations they typically don't have like one hospital they always go to. Uh, but yes sorry continue. So with this very example mm -hmm. you could do that in the private version of your two-column matrix? Uh, the private version? The table that you had, like you oh, had yes. different understandings of privacy. And so you could do this kind of analysis in the setting where the client can only access the differentiated privacy? Yeah, so for, I think, well, for these, you could do that. So like, where they have the like, output as a count, you can, instead of outputting the true count, you could have a, a noise account, right? Yeah, but uh, I... I'm talking about the whole set, like wait, this example that you had where you try to basically create a new record that has data from several hospitals. Mm -hmm. How would you do that in the private? Um, I guess I'm, I don't know if I'm you said, totally understanding. You said that you have a patient who has a diagnosis in one? Yes. And then a treatment in another? Yes. Right? And how could you then like, so you do a join of these. Yeah. If in your differentiated private setting, how could you do that successfully? Uh, so the initial, all the comp initial computation is going to be still be done using secure multi SMC, secure multi-body computation. Mm -hmm. And so the way that actually works, I don't know if I can, is that um, when we do this initially, so everybody, each of the parties in the computation is going to be executing this query. And so before we, when we first start, uh, we actually do a union across all the databases together, uh, and they create the secret share of the total of all the results. And each hospital will get a share of that. So each hospital will have sort of access to an encrypted version of the, the union of all the databases. Mm -hmm. And then they can then they can use SMC to do all this computation that they want. Um, hopefully that makes sense. And we can also. So the client doesn't see the. I'm trying to, like, from a perspective of the researcher, right, mm -hmm. that does work with that yes. data. What would she see? She uh, would she only see the noisy version of that at the end. Yeah, she would only see the, out, the final output. And so most of the SMC, and uh, that's going to be guarding the data owners from each other. Okay. So like hospital A from hospital B. Because they're honest but curious, so that they they will follow the protocol, but they'll still like sort of peak at the execution, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Okay. Okay. So.
Uh, let's thank to the speaker again. I guess we reconvene in 